Well, that didn't take long. No one sets the tone more than the President of the United States. Uh, and the tone that he sets is one of division, often one of hatred. This has now become a struggle about good versus evil. And the President of the United States is evil. This man was, the flames of his hatred were fanned by a president who kept talking about this caravan of refugees as if they were terrorists. So as they blame Trump's words for violence, do they realize they're excusing the violent acts themselves while offering a case for leniency for the actual perps? If the actions of evildoers are out of their own control and nothing else could have led to the violence, then how can you even begin to punish these creeps? It's wrong. Meanwhile, for both the bomber and the shooter, President Trump, Mr. Law and Order, pushes the death penalty. There is no ambiguity there. He places the blame firmly on the dirtbags and, like most Republicans, seeks out the stiffest penalty, literally the stiffest. This contradicts the media, who see Trump as a hateful ringleader who sympathizes with such cretins. Speaking of those suspects, they were total losers, failures in life, who placed their rage on others, and anyone with an opinion could provide a trigger. Because words can influence. It's why there's advertising. But that's a scary path to take, especially for Hollywood, rap stars, and video game makers, or even people paid to speak carefully and thoughtfully. The president of the United States is racist. Even Albert Einstein may have ended up in a Nazi concentration camp with Donald Trump's viewpoint on immigration. If you vote for Trump, then you, the voter, you, not Donald Trump, are standing at the bar border like Nazis going, you here, you here. So you want hate? You spend two years calling a guy Hitler, a racist, a traitor, and insane. Then you blame him for violence because of nicknames? No lectures from you, kids. But even more, to cite words as the cause eliminates the suspect's entire history and the slew of variables that brought him to commit his crimes. It makes no sense legally or morally, but politically, I guess that's another story. After all, why let a crisis go to waste, except that you'll make another one far worse? All right, Lisa, they didn't waste any time. I mean, I guess we saw it coming that they would, uh, they would pin the blame on, on Trump. Well, absolutely, if you've been paying any attention to the media over since President Trump even announced. But look, there's obviously a complete double standard in the media. We know this. When something happens to Republicans, the media and the left say that we need to have civility on both sides. When something happens and is directed at Democrats, it is purely Republican and President Trump's fault. But it's also just intellectually dishonest, because if you look at the mail bombing suspect, this guy has a rap sheet going back to 1991. He made a bombing uh, terrorist threat in 2002. Uh, and then if you look at the synagogue shooting, this guy hated President Trump because he didn't think he was an anti-Semite. Mm -hmm. So if you actually look at the facts, it doesn't drive the narrative that the media is driving. But the only reason they do it is because the, media are, the midterms are around the corner and they want to hurt President Trump. Mm -hmm. Juan, can I play uh, Sarah Sanders responding Please. to a reporter uh, about the, uh, this whole thing? mess? Go. Why is he out there? When you say he's trying to unite the country, why is he out there? The very first Jonathan, attacks? the very first thing that the president did was condemn the attacks both in Pittsburgh and in the pipe bombs. The very first thing the media did was blame the president and make him responsible for these ridiculous uh, acts. You can't start putting the responsibility of individuals on anybody but the individual who carries out the crime. He's delivered on the promises he's made, and if anything, I think it is sad uh, and divisive the way that every single thing that comes out of the media, 90% of what comes out of the media's mouth is negative about this president. So, Juan, my question to you is, I think you can hold two opinions that Trump's discourse, you will say, is divisive, and I could say that. That because he's pugnacious, so you know it's divisive, but that also ma mass killers are responsible for their actions alone. Don't you think that tying that together and putting it on him is politically opportunistic? Uh, politically opportunistic. I led, the, I led no. you with the answer. No, but, I'm, but, I'm, but, I'm, but I want to engage you seriously because I think this is such a serious topic. But I think that you're right. There are two thoughts, and they can be held simultaneously. Right. In other words, that, in fact, you have to hold the culprit responsible for his individual action. It's also the case that the president engages in divisive speech. And that's the problem here. I think that he's up the ante in terms of that divisive speech. So part of it, and what I heard in your 
monologue and from Lisa is blame the press, that the press is not fair to him, and he's gone back now to the press is the enemy of the people. But I think this goes, from my perspective, beyond that, because his rhetoric is so intense that I think it has, you know, sort of created an atmosphere of more kind of dissonance and vitriol than we're accustomed to. To my mind, you know, what we've seen the last week or so, it makes me wonder, is this America? How did we get to this point? And then over the weekend, you know, just, you know, put me aside, because I, I just worry that, you know, say, oh, well, that's Juan Williams, there's the press again. But here, 35,000 people, Greg, uh, saying the president will not be welcome in Pittsburgh unless he denounces white nationalism. And here's words from this group. This is a Jewish group, Ben the Ark. They say, for the past three years, your words, your policies have emboldened a growing white nationalist movement. You yourself call the murderer evil, but yesterday's violence is the direct culmination of your influence. Okay, I don't know much about that group, but I do know, I think we have tape from CNN when they were actually asking this specific rabbi from that uh, synagogue about whether Trump was welcome there. I think we have that. I'm talking slow enough so you can set it up. <laughs> Would that work? Mm. President Trump has talked about coming to Pittsburgh and coming to your synagogue in the aftermath of this. Do you want him to come? The, Rab the president of the United States is always welcome. Um, I'm a citizen. He's my president. He's certainly welcome. There you go. Uh, Kill me. What are your thoughts on what uh, if you care to respond to Juan about his feelings? Uh, I don't know any of those groups. Okay. I don't know any of those groups, but it just it sounds like Democratic talking points. Sounds like something Tom Steyer said on CNN on Sunday, who I didn't ever say talk besides the ads that he bought and the money he made. I, I was just stunned. If you ask me when this happened, first, the bombers discovered to the shooting at the synagogue. I thought maybe by Sunday, on a Sunday show, some pundit looking to get a uh, network contract would go ahead and say, I think the president's to blame. I did not know the same night, the same day, within an hour, they said, ha ha, look at what you see. What the president does, and it, it works to his detriment, is he watched everybody talk about all this. Mm. And it had him seething, as if we were sitting outside the glass listening to uh, the five talk about us. For him, he's listening to this, and he's outraged. So what does the president do? Exactly what he did his entire life at the Trump Organization as a candidate and as a president. I'm going to go tweet out. I'm going to speak out. You guys are blaming me for this. You're making it worse. The way you treat me has my 60 million who voted for me and maybe more seething, ready to go. Now, that has nothing to do with that lunatic in Florida and that, nut, that nutcase in Pittsburgh. But I do think that there's a, there's a sense out there that Trump, is, Trump and his supporters have been categorized like as white nationalists because they voted for him and they're tired of it and he's speaking for them. I don't think it's about voting for him. I think that if you look back at some of the actions, not only the bomber and then the shooter, but I mean, go back to Charlottesville, Proud Boys and all this kind of stuff, that there's a growing white nationalist rage in this country and people are like, whoa. Look, you do down. realize though that the President Trump's daughter is Jewish. His son-in-law is Jewish. His grandchildren are Jewish. I actually think President Trump has a special uh, spot in his heart for the Jewish community, you see that in his actions as well, moving the embassy to Jerusalem, being the first sitting president to visit the Western Wall. So I think that is often not talked about uh, in this national dialogue is the fact you know, that this is things, so close to the president. One of the things, Lisa, that really bugged me about Charlottesville, everybody put it in terms of the Confederate statues, black, white. But, you know, they had guys with tiki torches and automatic weapons standing outside a synagogue so the Jewish people had to exit through the back door. And those same guys said, oh, what a shame that Mr. Trump would allow his beautiful daughter to marry a Jew. They were but, universally condemned. Can, uh, let me get Dana in here. Uh, the media, oddly enough, didn't mind Louis, Louis Farrakhan's tweets earlier this week where he said, where he compared uh, Jews to termites, but uh, we'll not go there. You had Andrew McCarthy on your mm -hmm. show, and I made a really important point that back in the 70s, the United States was a much smaller country. I don't know how many by millions, mm -hmm. but had many, many more of these kinds of attacks. Mm -hmm. So yep. we And in fact, it was the New York Times yesterday had this amazing report. It was like well, it was on their website, like really well done. I'd point anyone to it. It was actually talking about 1968 because it was the right. 50th anniversary. And we're looking at this now that in 1968, just how divisive things were. I do think we all have to keep in mind that keeping a red line between speech and violence is really important. That's how America was founded. Exactly. I also feel like the president could figure out a way to read the room a little better. And I might, that mean like the country, right? Like take, take a couple minutes, mm. like tap the brakes just a little bit because um, for better or worse, people tend to look up to leaders 
and they want to feel better about the moment. And if the moment becomes about him and the media's treatment of him, then we're just right back down into it. And then somebody's going to have to step forward and do something. I, can I just add one last thing? Sure. Now we got to go. And that is the, 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 the issue of radicalization of people. We've, we've talked about this a lot during the war on terror. How does it happen, right? Well, you have hopeless people, purposeless people, people who are ignorant, and then they find purpose in something that they find somewhere now mm -hmm. is online. So that if you have radical Islamists, that how do they find it? And there's something that tip, there's always, a, there's something. I don't necessarily think it's speech, mm -hmm. but there is a culmination of it. And if you look at this guy's background, Boyer's background, um, he, he certainly had it, right? He turned evil and vile mm -hmm. into violence. And what we should be talking about, what the president said is, I'll do everything in my power to stop it from happening again. Okay, so what, do you, what is in your power to do? And that's some pretty uncomfortable conversations about privacy mm -hmm. and the ability to, we can prosecute very well. What we don't seem to be able to do as well is to prevent. Right, and then you think about what, what prevented, how institutionalization was there for unstable individuals. We don't have that anymore. There are a lot of, there are a lot of unsavory, unstable people. We, we don't know where to put them. And uh, this other guy, the bomber, everybody, he was out, he was hiding in plain sight, apparently. Yeah. Uh, he, he, his, his five minutes before he yeah. left, he posted, I can't take this anymore because he couldn't take any more refugees coming in and Jewish, yeah. supported by the Jewish uh, community. So if it was five minutes before, it was from five minutes from posting to shooting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As composed as Barack Obama is and his charismatic great speech, I get it. But if he was blamed for the South Carolina shooting, for the Gabby Gifford shooting, if he was blamed for Sandy Hook, he might fly off the handle, too. All right. Are you kidding me? What you got there is a contrast between right. someone who talked mm -hmm. about hope and change and someone who presses the fear so button happen? and demonizes so the immigrant caravan years? and then opens the but door that, to suggestions that point. Jews are somehow and responsible for the caravan. It's not the language. we got to go.